The original Game Boy Advance is a fantastic console. However, the shoulder buttons often feel a little bit mushy and not particularly responsive when you're playing. I noticed a little while ago that Zlab sell clicky buttons as a replacement alternative, and when the left trigger on my purple Game Boy Advance started to get inconsistent again, I figured it was time for a replacement and a perfect opportunity to try out some of the clicky buttons. Now, there are two options available, a short travel and a long travel. Now, the short travel are a longer button, which means Means that you have less distance for your trigger to move before you engage the click. The long travel are a shorter button so that there's more distance for the trigger to travel before it clicks and engages. Now when I checked on the website there was only the long travel available so that's what I ordered but I would like to try out the short travel in future. Now I encountered a few problems along the way which I'll detail in the video but what I've ended up with is a really pleasant tactile experience with some really responsive buttons. Hi and welcome back to the shed. I'm Joe Bleeps and this Game Boy Advance now has clicky buttons. So before I get exactly into the installation process of the buttons, there's just a few things I want to talk about. So for the past week, I've been away having a lovely relaxing time and I got back on Friday and I was thinking about not doing a video for this weekend. However, I recently got this Miniware TS-80P USB powered soldering iron and I'd been dying to try it out. I had a few repairs and soldering jobs that I wanted to try out on Game Boy Advance and I'd also bought a new little engineer soldering iron stand and tip cleaner. So it felt like a no brainer to set up the soldering iron, do a little bit of a repair and try it out and see what I think. Now I should have known that I was tired, I was short on time and things like this very rarely go to plan so it didn't quite go as smoothly as anticipated. Jumping straight in with a brand new soldering iron was a bad idea. Don't get me wrong it is a great piece of kit however having spent years using my trusty Antex CS18 with a sharp tip I am so used to using this I know exactly what to expect from it and this is a little different. There's actually a lot more you can do with this. It's got a much finer tip. You get a lot more control. You can alter the temperature of the tip depending on the job you're doing. It's a great soldering iron and it's been really well reviewed and I've been looking forward to trying it. However, I should really have tested it out on some simple jobs first and got a feel for it instead of just being overconfident. I will spend more time with it in the interim. I'm looking forward to getting the hang of using it and I might buy a few different tips for using on it and try those out too. However, what I set out to do was install the the clicky buttons from Z Labs onto the shoulder buttons in this Game Boy Advance. So I've had a few issues with the left shoulder button in this one in the past. I did do a repair with some alcohol. It worked for a little while and then it stopped. I then dismantled the switch, replaced it with some parts from a DS Lite shoulder button, I think, or maybe an original DS shoulder button. And that worked for a bit and then became a little bit erratic in terms of when it was working and when it wasn't. And seeing as I had the clicky shoulder buttons that I was waiting to try out on a project, I figured I may as well try and install them in here. Now it was only when I opened it up that I remembered this was the Game Boy where I installed the switch for the Pro Sound mod that I did and there's a lot of delicate wiring inside. So it was a little bit awkward to get open and there are wires everywhere so it's not just as straightforward as you'd normally have with a Game Boy Advance. I've been able to just pop the back off, take out the motherboard, swap the buttons over and there we go. But as we know I like a challenge and I do seem to be somewhat masochistic with these things so I went ahead with it anyway. I mean the thing is it doesn't matter how good the Game Boy is or how well the Pro Sound mod works if the shoulder button's no good the shoulder button's no good it needed doing so i pushed on ahead i opened up i managed to remove the motherboard that meant i could put the front part of the game boy to one side with all the buttons and the screen and so on and taking a look at the shoulder buttons you'll see that it's very different to the one that you buy from Z Labs, and it does need a little bit of modification a little bit of tinkering to get it in place not anything too complicated but it's not just a straight swap that you might expect so if you look at the shoulder buttons inside the Game Boy Advance there are four solder points but only two of those are from the switch the other two are from a kind of anchor point with like a metal bracket that the buttons sit flat against so the bracket it just withstands the pressure from repeated pushing of the buttons and the button itself just sits to the front of it with two pins soldered into the motherboard. So the first thing to do is remove the old buttons. There are four holes in the bracket with little plastic pegs poking through to lock the button in place and looking at the new buttons they don't actually have those little pegs on. Once it's soldered in position they're not really needed it'll sit flat in place and the bracket will do its job of holding it in position. So I got a knife into the gap between the bracket and the switch, gave a little bit of a wiggle, levered the switch partly out but ultimately it's easier to just cut straight through and remove those little pegs. I did that on the buttons on each side and then flipped the motherboard over. So you'll 
see that there are four solder points on each of the buttons and it's the two nearest the edge of the motherboard that need removing. So the plan was to use my new soldering iron and to use my engineer solder sucker to heat the solder, melt it and suck up the solder and be able to remove the switches. However, as I say, I am not that familiar with this soldering iron yet. I was using a very fine point. I had it on a reasonable temperature, but not really enough to melt a full size blob quite easily and be able to suck it up. So I could have done with a higher temperature perhaps. I might have been better off with a bigger tip to sort of disperse the heat a bit more effectively. But again, this, this is something that will come with time. This is something that will come with practice and diving in with a job like this maybe was a bit of a mistake to start off with. That said, I did manage to get it working. One thing you can do if, if you're doing this kind of job and you're heating the solder and it's not quite melting is you can melt some solder on top of the join uh, to add additional solder that will be molten that will spread the heat from the iron that will heat up and melt the solder that's attached to the motherboard and then you can suck up the whole lot in one go and that is what I did now although the solder sucker will remove most of that solder you might still need to heat up the pins to be able to effectively remove it afterwards I did this by holding the switch with pliers on one side of the motherboard and reheating the pins on the back <laughs> unfortunately the switch that I'd reassembled and re built from the DS parts just kind of crumbled and fell apart when I heated it and got the pliers onto it. But the other one came out relatively easy with a bit of a reheat and a wiggle. Most of the holes were usable. Uh, one of them was clogged up with solder and it took quite a bit of effort with the new soldering iron to try and reheat it. The solder that was on there, I don't know what was up with it, but it was really, really stubborn and didn't want to remove. So it wasn't just a straightforward case of heating it and sucking up the solder, but that is what I managed to do eventually. Just additional solder, a bit of flux and patience really um, my best way of doing it was to take the tip of the iron and just gently ease it through the hole and then suck up the solder from the back and then that cleared out the hole ready for me to put the switches in place so that brings us on to the new switches you see it's got like these four legs attached to it uh, you've got two on one side and two on the other what you actually have to do is bend those pins out because they need to be a bit more straight kind of like parallel to the the bottom of the switch and you need to remove two on one side and the other two are the ones that are going to go into the motherboard. Now there is a little bit of a kink to the wires so you will need to give it a little bit of a wiggle as it goes through but this does help stop it from dropping out so it's, it's not a problem at all. Once they're in position the switch should fit perfectly. In my case it sat flat against the motherboard and flat against the bracket and was going to be in the perfect position. However what you've got to be careful of is when you flip the board over to do your soldering you might end up with it moving slightly and you don't see that until you've done your soldering and you turn it back over. So what I did was I bent the pins away from the motherboard. This kind of forced the switch back against the bracket and held it in place while I did my soldering. I used a pair of snips to remove the excess wire and checked my switch. Uh, the clickiness was working really effectively. It was in just the right position. It felt like it was really secure against the bracket and wasn't really suffering from not having those little pins locating it in place. And it didn't really seem to be suffering from not having those four little plastic pins to locate it in place. So that was good. I did the same with the switch on the other side. And at this point, it seemed really good. However, when I've been doing all this and moving it all around, I did notice that one of the wires from my ProSound install had come away. Um, I couldn't remember which wire it was or where it had gone, so I had to go away and check my own tutorial to see where it was supposed to go. Uh, but it did give me an opportunity to do some fine detail soldering um, to put it back in position and put a very small wire against a very small component. And in that case, the soldering iron excelled. Now, speaking of reassembly, I eventually managed to get everything lined up without any of the wires pinching, put it all back together again. And then when I came to test, unfortunately it wasn't working everything was together everything fitted neatly the switches moved freely but there was no click i think i, I don't know whether it's something to do with the the wires or the screen in there that are just pushing things slightly the wrong way i don't know what it is but when i came to actually move them it had that long travel it felt like say the switch was here and, and the button was getting to it but not quite enough to click and engage it felt like there was a lot of travel and sometimes it clicked sometimes it wouldn't if if you had it if you kind of pressed a bit more towards the front of the console and clicked it, it engaged. But if you just pushed down and it slid back, it, it wouldn't quite locate. I tried loads of things. 
I took it apart, put it back together. I tried finding some, um, I thought it might be the shoulder buttons themselves were worn or damaged. So I took them apart and inspected those. They seemed okay. I swapped for some shoulder buttons from a different Game Boy Advance, just in case that was even worse. Um, so I, I really was struggling with trying to work out what it was that, that was causing the main issue. But the truth of it was that I had the long travel buttons. It was having that long travel and it was struggling to engage. What I needed really was the short travel and I think if I bought these again, I would definitely get the short travel buttons. It'd be a lot more straightforward. <laughs> I'd probably do it in a Game Boy that didn't have a whole load of wires and other stuff installed in it already. However, I am not one to be beaten by something like this. I wanted to try and find a way of working around it. So the issue was that with my buttons, the switch was in there, the switch was working, but the actual button itself wasn't quite locating. It wasn't quite reaching it. It was a little bit too far away and it needed to be closer. I thought about sticking something onto the switch itself to extend that little button and make it so that this would come into contact. But that was gonna maybe get a little bit messy. I wasn't sure what to stick on. I could have 3D printed some parts and put them on, but would they stay in place? That there were a few things. And then when I was looking at the bottom of the triggers, there's actually a hole that's just in the right spot where I could maybe have put a screw in place. Now I've got a lot of tiny screws. I've got a few that I ended up using that I think were maybe from a Joy-Con shell or a DS Lite, something like that. Just a very, very small crosshead screw. And what I thought I might try is screw it in to the inside of the button. So what I thought I might do is if I screw that into the central area of the button where it normally meets the switch, then I would actually have a, a variable distance between the switch because if I screw it all the way in we've got our maximum distance with a little bit of travel and then a click but the screw head would be enough to be able to engage that click or if I unscrewed it a little bit we'd get much less travel so it kind of is is an adjustable switch that was the theory I wasn't sure if it was going to work so I put a screw in one side figured I'd, I'd do a quick test so I just located it in place and it seemed to work quite well. In fact, the metal against the hard plastic gives it an even more sort of solid feeling click. It could be really annoying to some people. It is kind of noisy, but it does work. I was thrilled that it worked because I was starting to lose heart with the whole thing, with the issues with the soldering iron and the switch is not working and my wires coming off. I was just kind of at the end of my tether. So when I came up with an idea and it worked, I thought, great, we've got a video. We can save this. <laughs> it's just as well, really, isn't it? So a very, very long winded video, but this is the tip. And this is the thing, we do encounter problems. When we're modding things, rarely go smoothly. And when we encounter problems, what we've got to do is come up with creative solutions. And if you come up with something that works, then that's great. That's something you can share with other people and then they can try it and it'll help avoid them having those problems. So the takeaway from this video is if you want to have clicky buttons and you want to have some control over the amount of clickiness that you get or the level of engagement that you get, then all it takes is two very small screws to modify the buttons themselves, not the switch and you can actually tweak it until you've got just the right amount of travel you want, put everything back together, and thankfully, when I tested it, it worked. I've got a test cartridge that I tried out first that actually <laughs> you need to hold L and R when you switch on to access the menus. So obviously I wasn't able to do any testing beforehand, but it was a very good sign when it finally loaded up and I was able to access that menu. And when I could access the menu, both the L and the R were really, really responsive. In terms of the clickiness, obviously this is the clicky buttons. This one's got the regular buttons. And if I hold those from a similar distance to my microphone, we've got clicky and the regular. Wow, what an exciting video. <laughs> and then after that, I loaded up my favorite game for testing the shoulder buttons, particularly when I'm doing macro builds and things like that. Super Street Fighter 2X Revival. When I put this one into practice mode, it allows me to just test out all the buttons and see what works. And testing with the L and R button over and over again. They were responding really well. It worked fantastically every time. So we got something successful in the end. Those clicky buttons are awesome. I do want to try out the short travel ones on a different Game Boy Advance at some point soon. And if you want to try them out yourself or you want to do any modding, then get yourself onto Z Labs. They are a fantastic website to support my channel by giving me an affiliate link that I've left in the description. You use that link 
at no extra cost to you, you'll get a little bit extra back to my channel. And if you use the code Joe Bleeps, you'll get a little bit of money off your order as well. So I would encourage you to check them out, not just for the switches, but for all the other stuff they do for so many consoles and all the tools and equipment you need to do it as well. In terms of the soldering iron and the soldering iron stand, I got those from Amazon. I'll add those to my storefront and I'll link those in the description too. So yes, we came away with a bit of a success. I love the idea of these adjustable clicky shoulder buttons and maybe that idea might appeal to some other people too. However, getting there was not entirely fun. I do love a bit of problem solving, but when you are faced with problem after problem after problem after problem, it can get you down a little bit. And what it highlighted to me is that I make all these videos in my shed. Like I am literally in a shed here. I've kind of converted it. I've walled it out. I've insulated it. I've got all my stuff in here, but essentially I am in a very small six foot by seven foot shed with a lot of stuff in here. And what it's highlighted to me is that it's become a very different space to the one I started working in. And it's not really working for me particularly well at the moment. Like I'm sat here speaking to the camera at the same desk where I normally do all of my modding. And it's a case of having to set things up, put them away, move them. I've got all of my 3D printing stuff out over here that I don't use as much as I did. I've got stuff cluttering up every surface. Every time I want to set up this camera, I need to move my tools and things to the side. It's not a workable space. So I'm going to put this video together put it out on YouTube and then over the next week, cause I'm still off work, I'm gonna spend some time reorganizing this shed. And in the next week or two, I'll let you know how I'm getting on. Uh, let you see what I came from, what my priorities were. And if you wanna see it, I'll give a bit of a tour with the before, the after, the rationale behind it all and walk you through my modding workspace and also my filming workspace, which I will hopefully have set up by then as well. If you're interested in seeing that, do let me know in the comments. And if there's anything particular you'd like me to go over or detail, then, you know, let me know and I'll, I'll try and include that. In the meantime, there are a couple of other projects that I am working on that I'm looking forward to sharing with you. So they'll be coming up soon. If you want to see any of that, please subscribe, sign up for notifications. I try to put out a new video every week. So as soon as that appears on a Sunday afternoon, you'll get to watch it. So that's it for now. This is Joe Bleeps signing off from the shed. If you want to keep watching me, there's some videos popping up here for you to watch. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next video. Bye.